Let's see, that's seven after. So maybe we'll just get started with some <clears throat> preliminaries. Um, I have a number of handouts for you. Um, I talk a lot, I digress a lot, uh, so you're encouraged to take notes because um, I might just start rambling off about something and you might be like, oh, and want to jot that down. Um, if you're feeling uh, moved to munch on some treats, feel free to come up and help yourself. Um, I'll eventually get to talking about it, but if, if you just can't stand it anymore, um, this is lemongrass popcorn. Uh, it's coconut oil, it's organic, um, Bob's Red Mill popcorn um, with um, doTERRA's certified pure therapeutic grade essential oil, which you can safely take internally. There's one drop of that with some nutritional yeast and a little bit of garlic salt. So that's what that is. Um, these are dehydrated fruit. Um, it's all organic, everything in there, figs, mango, um, there's strawberries, there's probably like five different types of apples, there's a fruit fly that's trying to eat it. Um, there's some peaches and some nectarines, there might even be a piece of plum in there. Um, feel free to help yourself to that. And this is a green salad, it's gluten free, um, it's uh, Indian basmati rice. Uh, millet, um, dehydrated uh, Asian pear, some sun-dried tomatoes, some parsley, some um, pumpkin seeds, a little bit of hemp seed, guam masala, cinnamon stick, kind of uh, Indian-inspired green salad. Um, there's a pad of paper here too if you need some extra paper to write on. I know it's small, but feel free to help yourself to that. And um, welcome, Kate, right? Nice to see you. Welcome, Serena. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, that's Julie and staff. <laughs> and Jacob from Buy Nothing Project. He's your fellow. Um, and Teresa and Emily and Toria. And wow. Keith is going to film. Um, your presence here means a lot to me because it helps me get better at doing this because I think this is really important. Um, I'm not a recipe girl. Um, I find that recipes are really frustrating. You, you see the picture, you wanna make the picture, it sounds good, you know, the ingredients sound good, but maybe there's a few ingredients that you don't have and so you feel like you have to go to the store and buy these ingredients that you wouldn't otherwise have in your cupboard. And so it seems really backwards to me. And so I figure if it's backwards to me, it might feel backwards to other people. And so I kind of come from this place of the easiest way to, to start incorporating more plant-based foods into our diet is to already have the ingredients in our pantry that we need and then the tools that we need to um, combine them, the tips and the tricks to make it easier so that it's not so um, you know, stressful. I think a lot of people think, oh God, I just don't have time to chop all day. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit of how to make that a little bit easier so that you don't feel like you're spending all your days making food. Um, one of the things that I think is really important, you can take one of these and pass it around, um, is having starting with the right tools. Um, so this is the first thing we're going to just go over real quickly. Um, feel free to take you know all the handouts you can take home with you. Um, a little bit of background about me. Um, I come from the Midwest. I grew up in a family that ate a really healthy version of the standard American diet. Um, Midwesterners are all about uh, the animal products, the cheese. I grew up on a sailboat. We ate lots and lots of seafood. Seafood was actually the hardest thing um, for me really to give up because there aren't really a whole lot of replacements for it. But now I've kind of, I've kind of learned how to, how to get around that too. And, and there isn't really anything that I, that I crave or miss anymore that can't be um, uh, resolved with some sort of plant food combination. Um, at, at some point in time, uh, my health was pretty poor and um, I, I was 215 pounds and my habits weren't in alignment with my values and I didn't really even understand how that was going to transform to this, but in having um, some chronic health problems, and when I say chronic, that's their word, not mine, I, I don't do well with uh, having authority tell me that I'm going to be sick forever and I have to take this medication or the prescription. It just didn't sit well with me. And so 
it started me on a journey, a four-year journey of um, really educating, self-educating myself on um, food and manipulating my diet and changing the way I ate and swapping out things in my pantry for other things that worked better for me. And so it's, um, it's that education that I got over a period of time and I'm constantly learning. I mean, I'm still learning. And it's, it's, I'm always really excited to learn something new. For example, uh, I went to get basmati rice. I have bought it several times. California basmati rice is not Indian basmati rice. It is not the same thing. And people think, oh, it's basmati rice. It's grown in California. It, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely more local. Um, but it doesn't have the same flavor, texture, mouthfeel, consistency. It looks very much like just long green white rice. Um, in fact, I actually called Whole Foods and I was like, I think you put the long green white rice in the wrong bin or, you know, I wasn't sure what was going on. So this is true Indian basmati. Just found that out. So um, one of the things that might be finished cooking by the time you leave tonight is I've got some uh, flag violet beans simmering in a crock pot with garlic and carrots and some sea salt. Uh, we've got parsley and um, rosemary to add to it. Um, I was hoping that would be done, but I had no water all day, and so it was kind of a challenging day to, to try to cook and figure that out. Um, a crock pot, you can find these at Goodwill. You could maybe uh, join the Buy Nothing Project and ask for your crack pot there. Um, people get these things as gifts and they put them in their closet and they maybe come out and maybe they don't. Sometimes they come out and then they go back in the closet. Um, so crack pots are plentiful. To find one that doesn't have a cracked lid is maybe the most challenging part, but otherwise make sure that the lid fits. Um, I tell people crack pot is a tool for making ingredients mostly. Um, so I find that it's really helpful to simmer beans in a crock pot. You can do it while you're sleeping, you can do it while you're you know, at work all day. Um, you can put beans and carrots and make a really simple um, uh, simmer all day long like the one that I've got going. But for the most part, I think that if you put a bunch of stuff in a crock pot, it kind of all ends up being mush and is really hard to, uh, there are ways of reviving the flavor and actually having a really good tasting soup. But I find that it is really convenient for making beans and legumes and you can make it in a quantity and then portion them and then freeze them in your freezer and take out little bits of beans at a time. Um, kombu is a type of sea vegetable uh, that you can buy at the Asian stores and you can use scissors to snip up a piece and put that in with your beans. Whether you're doing it on a stove top or in a uh, crock pot, it's a good way to reduce uh, the amount of gas that might come up for you. It um, makes the beans more digestible. Where would you get that? At any Asian store. So like, uh, I mean, I usually do a, a, a once every three month trip to Fubon, Grocery Outlet, and maybe Trader Joe's if I'm nearby. But uh, for the most part, everything else I get um, is organic produce that I personally get from Food Not Bombs because I work for that organization. But um, CSAs, Community Supported Everything, is a great way to get your produce. Um, uh, you can also join bulk buying groups um, you can, there's also um, several new businesses where you can even call ahead and get organic groceries and produce and they'll have them delivered to you. So there's lots of ways of getting that. Um, uh, medium sized pan with tight fitting lid. This is just really basic for preparing grains. Um, I think I've had my pot since college. It's not really pretty, but it does the job very, very well. Um, wok pan or iron skillet. I used to have a wok pan that you can just get at Ikea for cheap, but I found mine at Goodwill. I have long since retired that and now I have cast iron skillets. Um, one of the things that some people have a concern about, regardless of what diet, is um, having iron. And absorbing iron is can be difficult, just like absorbing B vitamins can be difficult, but if you have a healthy digestion and you have a wide variety of nutrients in your, in your diet, um, 
you have less issue with absorbing the iron. But this is a great way of getting extra iron. Yeah, all you have to do is put food in it and cook it. And it's awesome. And this is a little one that I got from the Buy Nothing Project. So I'm going to keep talking about the Buy Nothing Project because every time I look at these two, I'm going to be like, Buy Nothing Project! It's so great! Um, silicone spatulas. I didn't believe it when my ex-boyfriend told me, Savvy, you don't have a silicone spatula? Because he's a cook. That's what he does. He's like, we have to get you some. And he immediately took me to Ross Dress for Less. And they had, uh, you know, five colors for, with bamboo sticks on them for, you know, four ninety nine or something like that. Um, I've also seen them at Grocery Outlet. Um, I think I purchased this one at City Liquidator Liquidators for like two ninety nine or something like that. The reason why I like this one is because it all comes apart and cleans really easily. I still prefer the ones that my ex-boyfriend bought me um, because they don't have this extra ridge right here. Mm -hmm. And so they scrape clean. Mm -hmm. um, but it's amazing. I don't like to waste anything. So I'm all about scraping the bowl and the silicone, but she's laughing at me because she knows me really well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, I just love, I love these. Life without the silicone spatula. Um, I just, and you know, I use it for sauteing. As long as you're not sticking this in a hot pan and going like that, it's not gonna melt. Um, whereas the rubber spatulas that I grew up with, my, my mom, we always had rubber spatulas. They'd get all warped and weird after a while because at some point you leave it in here, but this one, this one is indestructible. A large chef's knife. This one's not even large. This one's probably a medium-sized one. I have many that are, not many, and I have probably three that are larger than this. Because I cook a lot, but you really only need one. I started out with one. It's like bikes. You start out with a bike in Portland, and before you know it, you have like five. Uh, large bamboo cutting board. Now, I brought a small one because it was either easier to get over here, but I have one that's about this big. It's multicolored that was really expensive and is gorgeous and it's really for presenting um, but the average size bamboo cutting board you can get them at grocery outlet you can get them at Ross Trust for Less, Marshalls um, you could ask the Buy Nothing Project for it like, does anybody have a bamboo cutting board they're not using they're really durable you can use walnut oil which has is high in omega-3s so it's good to drizzle on your salads anyway um, but a little bit of walnut oil rubbed on here or some lemon essential oil is a great way to keep your bamboo looking beautiful. Um, I like it because when you're cutting on it, you're not eating a bunch of wood and plastic. Um, and uh, yeah, I think they're really great. Um, I definitely recommend cutlery that is sharp versus dull. Um, more, mis more mistakes and cuts happen when you have a dull knife and you're trying extra hard to do something. That's when it slips and you end up cutting yourself. Um, the other thing is, is that some people have a lot of serrated knives. Um, I don't recommend serrated knives. A, you can't sharpen them yourself. Um, B, they're, they're not really doing anything for you. And C, they'll tear up your cutting board. So a sharp, non-serrated chef's knife is really the tool that everyone should have. Uh, and it may be a paring knife too, but I didn't bring that. Um, a large bamboo cutting board. Okay, garlic press. Not all garlic presses are created equal. Um, and particularly, hi, welcome. Let's get you one of these. What is your name? Michael. Michael? There you go. Um, garlic presses are not all created equal because uh, it takes a lot of hand pressure. You know, not everybody has that hand strength. And I find that this one from Ikea costs $2.99, uh, suggested by Julie's sister, Carrie, who said, <laughs> came into the kitchen one day and was like, oh my goodness the best because she was so excited and she shares enthusiasm for kitchen tools like me so I I said well you know if Carrie's excited I'm excited so I went to Ikea and I bought one I've had this since 2004 2005 it still functions beautifully 
Um, I like it because the basket comes completely out so you can clean it. And I like it because just the, the, the design of it, like even if I've got it packed to the, I can use both hands and really get in there. And you might be wondering, why, why do you need this garlic press? For years I was like, why, why, why? Well, the reason why is because the most uh, antibacterial, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory properties of the garlic is in the oil. And when you chop, my mom always taught me to take the big chef's knife and squish down the, you know, but I just, I snip off the end and I quarter it and I take the peel away. And then I put those quarters in my press and I get all that good oil and everything. I don't have to mince. Mincing takes forever and all the oil is all over the cutting board instead of in my soup. So that's why the garlic press, for me personally, from a nutritional perspective, I'm all about making every bite count. If you make every bite count, if there's nutrition in every bite of deliciousness that you eat, no, no deprivation, just deliciousness and nutrition, then you know, then uh, the wide range of possibilities that exist out there are much bigger than, I don't know, I just don't eat Twinkies or even the vegan Twinkies, they're out there. There's a, really the opportunity to eat all kinds of not so good, but even the not so good's got some nutrition in it because it's, it's yeah, the plants infused nutrition. Okay, um, six giant glass, clear glass jars um, this is this is a this is on the list for someone who's really just starting with. I don't really have a pantry. I have a couple of cans of beans and you know some some tortilla chips in my in my pantry. Um, these are also IKEA. Uh, they're not very expensive. I think they're maybe six ninety nine for the big one. I like to buy things in bulk because they. I just I I just wait until the quinoa is on sale. And when the quinoa's on sale, then I buy a bunch of quinoa, and I take it home and I put it in my jar. Um, and then the next time I'm at the store, if I see that barley's on sale, well, I buy a bunch of barley and I go home and I put it in my jar. Or sunflower seeds, or whatever, this is sunflower seeds right here. Um, raw nuts, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I find that you buy in bulk, you save money, you store it in glass, keeps the little moths away. Um, it keeps the moisture out. If you don't have a temperature controlled environment, it keeps the moisture out. And they're, they're, they're kind of pretty, you know? You put them on the shelf. I have mine all piled on top of the fridge, but um, I like them. They're, they're versatile. I like the clasp too. Sometimes, I mean, I use a, I often use Dr. Browner's uh, coconut oil and I buy it in a big jar and I like the big jar because it's cheaper when you buy in bulk but also because I reuse that jar and I use it for more of my greens at home so um, some kind of large glass or ceramic roasting pan, pan. Um, roasted root vegetables are sort of a staple in, in my home uh, no matter what combination I get uh, potatoes, beets, carrots, celery, onion, garlic, uh, turnips, rutabagas. Now turnips have a very strong flavor as do rutabagas. So I use the stronger flavored things sparingly, but all together when you've got the onion and the celery and the carrots and any root vegetable that you can come up with, you can throw some cauliflower, which is not a root vegetable, but it'll take about the same amount of time cooking. Um, I also am a fan of cutting things up uniformly, um, whether it be tomatoes in a salad or potatoes in a roasting pan. If you cut everything up in the same size dice, it'll all roast uh, together well. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, large soup or stock pot. I do have several large, I make soup and, and chilies and soups <coughs> all the time. Um, think of it this way, if, 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 you, if you put aside uh, a couple of, you don't even need a couple of hours because I can tell you how to do this without needing a couple of hours, but if every Sunday evening or afternoon you made one big pot of soup, 
And once it cools to room temperature, you put it in little containers and you stick it in your freezer. Label it, write on it with a Sharpie and put it in the freezer. If you do that four times a month, then at the end of that month, you've got four different types of soup revolving in your freezer. If you do it for two months, right? Two months out of 12 months out of the year, if you do it for two months every Sunday, that's eight soups or stews or chilies that are in portions. And you usually get somewhere between, depending on how much you make, but like in a, the largest soup pot that you can find, you can probably get between six and eight portions out, you know, to eat with your apple or your grain salad or a piece of big crusty bread if you're into that sort of thing. Um, but I like variety. I don't like making some chili and then eating chili every single day for a week because that gets boring. And boring isn't sustainable. So variety is sustainable, right? So uh, just keep that in mind. And maybe you're someone who likes to come home from work and at the end of the day, that's when you start making some dinner, but maybe you also chop some extra veggies and make some soup too. Um, not everybody wants to do it on the weekend, but whatever works for you. I'm just putting that as an example of how quickly it adds up. And if you portion it and freeze it, it's so much easier. If I wake up in the morning and I'm like, crap, I need lunch, you know, it's easy for me to open my crisper drawer, which is not where I keep my vegetables, by the way. I open up my crisper drawer, I grab a granola bar or some sort of seed bar, chia something, or I have a bunch of stuff in there. And I grab one of those and I grab an apple or an Asian pear, some piece of fruit, um, maybe some almonds. And then I open the freezer and I grab a soup or a stew or something in there. And there's lunch. I got lunch that's taken care of. I got a snack. I'm good. Um, I will often make things the night before and make bigger portions and then eat that the next day also for lunch. But it's good to have options. I like options. Um, <clears throat> egg timer, microwave, alarm. Believe it or not, it only takes 12 minutes to cook a pot of rice or quinoa or barley or amaranth or buckwheat or maybe it takes a little bit long for barley, but roughly 12 to 14 minutes. And I have this really great thing on my iPhone called the untimer. And the reason why I like it is because you can set it for any number of minutes and you can actually, if you were sitting there staring at it, you could watch the dots disappear. <laughs> um, that's less important for cooking rice than it is for practicing an elevator speech for work, for example. Um, but I do find it's also good for time management. If you're one of those people that needs to work solid for 20 minutes and then take 10 minutes to do something else and then work solid for 20 minutes. Anyway, I use it for lots of things. But the egg timer is um, important because you can set that egg timer and then go take a shower. Right? I mean, roughly the same time, by the time you're done with the shower, you get out of the shower, your rice is done. And it, it's almost like you didn't do anything. All you did was put a, a cup of rice in the thing and a, a cup and a half of water and bring it to a boil and stick the thing, the lid on and turn it down to simmer and then go take a shower. So very easy. Um, there might be something else that you do that takes roughly 12 to 14 minutes, but you just, whatever it is that you're doing, um, I don't know. I just, I think that that's a good way to realize that there's ways of preparing food that don't really take too much time up. And that's, that's one of them. KitchenAid mini three cup food processor. I know that's very, very specific, but I do not like Cuisinart. I'm not a Cuisinart fan. Um, I do use a Cuisinart, actually two different processors at Food Not Bombs and have grown accustomed to the Cuisinart. But I still prefer KitchenAid. So those are pretty much the two companies that seem to have taken over the culinary world. Um, I've had this one a really long time. Uh, it still functions beautifully. I like it because it's really easy to use. The top comes off, the blade comes off for easy cleanup. And then this, this just twists like this. When I first bought it, I had made hummus or some sort of dip, and I couldn't figure out that you had to like take everything apart in order to snap this thing off. And so I ended up putting the whole unit in the fridge 
so that the hummus wouldn't spoil. <laughs> so I, I eventually learned that it, it does that for a reason, right? I mean, this definitely has to snap in place. You put the lid thing on, you snap this like so, and it doesn't matter whether you put soaked cashews and a little bit of lemon juice and garlic and some curry powder in here and some tahini, garbanzo beans. I mean, you can make cheese dips, pate, tapenade, throw a bunch of, go to that, the olive bar at wherever you like to go to the olive bar and get, you know, almond and garlic stuffed olives, Kalamata olives or Greek olives or sun-dried tomatoes or pearl onions that are marinated and I don't know, whatever you like, toss it all in here. Zip, zip. You've got tapenade with crackers or whatever. Um, I use this all the time. I don't, I don't really care to have a bigger one. Do I have a bigger one? I have a bigger one. I never use it. I use this one all the time. And it comes with a little spatula that fits it perfectly. So it's, it's really, uh, yeah, oh, pesto, too. If you're growing basil, if you just snap off the top parts, you know, constantly trim your basil plant, throw some garlic, maybe some sun-dried tomatoes and some olive oil in here. I'm not a pine nut fan, personally, so I prefer uh, Brazil nuts or walnuts in my pesto. Um, Brazil nuts are high in selenium, walnuts are high in omega-3s. Um, I'm a big fan of switching it up all the time. I, that's what I was going to bring. I was going to bring walnuts, and the reason why I was going to bring walnuts is because at Sheridan's, you can buy Oregon walnuts that are hand-shelled. Wow. And they're a dollar more than California walnuts. A lot of people don't like walnuts because they have that bitter, they kind of have like little bitter taste to them. These are so sweet because they're hand shelled. They are not machine shelled. So the, that membrane, like I don't know if you've ever cracked open a wal walnut, but there's that membrane that kind of surrounds the little brains in there. And that membrane, little pieces of it get ground up in the machines and after a while, there's that powder that's all over the walnuts. Like if you go to the bulk bin and try to get walnuts out of the bulk, but there's powder everywhere. That, that powder is the bitter taste that I don't like. But the Oregon walnuts are fantastic. You've not had a walnut until you've had one of those. Where did you say to buy it? Sheridan's. Yeah, Sheridan's Fruit Market is on the corner of not quite Stark and MLK. Oak. Oak, thank you. All those trees over there, I mm -hmm. get, get confused what's going on. Does anybody have any questions about the basic tools list or feel that there's anything missing that you want to ask about? Anything? Okay. Well, I mean, specifically, uh, bamboo, I find that other types of wood are too soft and I end up getting bits of wood in my food. Um, there is an, another, there are several other materials. Um, there's one that Whole Foods sells. I don't know what the name of the material is, but it's not porous um, and it feels like a, like a wood or some sort of fibrous like it came from something that's really hard and they're really expensive. And I believe the name is like called Epicurious or something like that. No, Epicurious. Yeah, I don't like, like the bamboo that it's so hard, I guess, and it feels like rigid and, and like I'm doling my life every time I eat it. Mm. Um, and I, I don't like eating some wood. Okay. <laughs> well, you can, you can eat some wood. It's extra fiber. Yeah. It, it, won't, it won't hurt you um, unless it's preserved with something. So, you know, something to keep in mind. But, um, yeah, I like it. But, yeah, it's wood's fine if you like to eat wood. It's <laughs> good. Um, any other? Yeah. I know you're saying you don't like to um, like waste anything at all. What are your thoughts on juicing? Like, is that something that produces waste then you don't do it, or for like, nutrition reasons you don't like it? Because I just noticed there wasn't a juicer on here, and people have very different opinions on juice. It's true. Um, I, have, I have some opinions about juicing. I, um, my opinions have also shifted a little bit. Um, 
people with compromised immune systems who are unable to digest the amount of food required to get the nutrient density that they need to thrive, those people would really benefit from juicing. Um, if you're using a Vitamix, and notice there's not a Vitamix on this list, nor is there a dehydrator on this list, and quite frankly, if, if I had a 13th, 13th thing, I would put a dehydrator on there, I would not put a Vitamix on there. Okay. Now the reason why is because I recently um, was temporarily gifted with a Vitamix from someone that I did um, some food consulting for. She bought it, she didn't really like it, I couldn't believe, I mean I walked into her kitchen and I was like, you've got a Vitamix, I was all excited. Because I think you, you learn, at least I had learned or heard over and over again that the two things that you need if you're going to be vegan is you need a Vitamix and you need a dehydrator. And I wasn't sure that that was true, but I kind of went along with it and just kind of took that as, oh, that's got to be, and now everybody has differing opinions, but now that I've actually had an opportunity to use the Vitamix, I've never sworn so much at a machine in my life because I really expected it to do certain things for me that this does and that my regular glass blender does. Mm -hmm. I love my regular glass blender and if I need to make a smoothie, then I use my blender. If I need to make a sauce, I'll use my blender. If I wanna make cheese, nut cheese, seed cheese, or anything that's a little bit thicker, um, there has to be the right consistency going on. And if the consistency isn't right in a tall, skinny Vitamix, you either have to add water or you'll burn the motor out, right? And then you have to try to get it out, and I hated it. I just, I hated it. So I personally don't like the Vitamix, but getting back to your question, what a Vitamix does is you can put the fruit and the plants in there, and it blends everything up into a smoothie, including the fiber. And when you're consuming sugar and fiber, it's like they say that God created the poison and the antidote in the same thing, it's called the apple. Okay, because you have sugar, you have fiber, and you have it together. So when you eat sugar, the fiber helps it move through your long and bumpy digestive tract slowly. So you metabolize those sugars slowly. And then, and then you're not taxing any of your organs. You're not spiking your blood sugar. Um, juice is sugar, and there's no fiber in it, so it goes right through you just like alcohol goes right through you, which is why 88% of alcoholics are also hypoglycemic. And what they think is a craving for alcohol is actually a craving probably to eat food, but they get so much of their caloric intake and they're wanting more alcohol because it's, if their blood sugar isn't stable, they crave the alcohol because it's a quick fix to, to do this again. Mm. Um, so if you're juicing, and you know if that means waking up in the morning and you decide that you you know you want to make some green juice um if if you're also eating complex carbohydrates to give you energy if you're also eating a diversity of foods throughout the day that are fiber and that are fiber rich um and just to kind of give you an example in the paleolithic period of time in which humans were alive they consumed about 128 grams of fiber per day and was consuming about 3,800 calories a day. Now, granted, they were chasing down their food and yeah. picking berries and digging holes with things that they whittled from, you know, they spent a lot of energy to, to do all those things. But the average American today eats 20 grams of fiber. And we have long, bumpy digestive tracts that require fiber to push the nutrients through. Um, now one thing I'll say here, and I might say it again, and that's okay, is that as you transition to incorporating more plants in your diet, you're also going to bump up your fiber intake. When you bump up your fiber intake and you don't drink water, you're going to hurt, mm. right? Because the water, we need more water. Like we're all dehydrated. Like. I drink a lot of water, but I don't drink enough. None of us drink enough. It's like, when in doubt, drink more water. Because we're drinking coffee and alcohol and tea, and you know, we, we're exposed to things that we have no control over that dehydrate us. Um, when in doubt, drink more water. And with that, I'm going to take a look at it.
Um, if you are going to get a juicer, if you also have a dehydrator, then the fibrous pulp that comes out your juicer's bottom can be mixed in uh, with, uh, I haven't personally done it, but you know, sesame seeds and tamari and I don't know, you could doctor up that pulp and form it into a little cracker and stick it in your dehydrator and make little crackers so that you're still getting fiber at a later date. You know, and like I said, I haven't experimented with that because I don't have a juicer, so therefore I don't have the pulp. But I suspect I could probably go and get free pulp from canteen and they'd be like, here, give me a garbage bag full of it. But I have enough food projects going on right now. But that's one way of, of getting the nutrients from the plants. I mean, I think that's the reason why people juice is because they think that they can't possibly get all the nutrients they need just by eating food. Or maybe not eating, they, they're eating too much food or they feel like they're eating too much food. But if every bite counts, if every spoonful of anything you put in your mouth is nutrient dense, you shouldn't really need juicing. Like you should, you should have enough, uh, unless you have, but see, you know, there's all kinds of variables that come into play. If you have uh, some autoimmune disease that you're trying to reverse and stop. Um, that might be a good reason to be juicing. If you had to go through chemotherapy and you never really bounced back, uh, even though you kicked the cancer, but if you're still down and out, maybe juicing would be good for you to have those extra nutrients. But I, I think that people uh, are juicing maybe for the wrong reasons, and I think that there's a lot of people that are being told by medical professionals to eat one thing, and then they don't have any energy and, um, and I think there's a misconception that our energy comes from protein, and, and it doesn't. Uh, energy comes from carbohydrates, and complex carbohydrates are the ones that are gonna deliver it slowly, gradually over time, and the simple carbohydrates are the ones that you have to watch out for. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? Awesome, thanks for asking it. Any other questions? People also drink juice for the gut trendy. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard not to walk by cure and, you know, and everybody's all like, la, 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 outside with their little whatevers, but, you know, um, yeah, there's all kinds of things like that. I, I had a bubble tea the other day, and it's been a long time since I've had bubble tea. I loved it. It was so good. It was so good. I had, like, little, little tapioca nibblies and some aloe little aloe nibblies, and aloe is really good for your digestion. If you're suffering at all from IBS, uh, diverticulitis, Crohn's, or any of those um, autoimmune digestive candida, any of that, aloe juice is so good with the inner leaf. Um, and they make, they make beverages that are pretty tasty nowadays. They do have sugar in them though, and sugar is inflammatory. So if you're trying to reduce inflammation, it would be better to reduce your sugar as well, but um, that bubble tea is so good. <laughs> so um, this one is your pantry basics to pass around. Um, this is obviously not a comprehensive list. There's things on here even if I, even as I was preparing tonight that, that, I, don't, that I think I brought with me that are not even on here, but I wanted to make sure that we, that we talked about them. Um, so apple cider vinegar with the mother um, Bragg's is a is a great is a great uh, brand, um, but I get Trader Joe's often because it's affordable. Um, it has the mother in it, and it makes really good salad dressing. Um, I also like somebody taught me this to me. I also like to spray it or baste it on my popcorn and then add salt and nutritional yeast for kind of like a um, yeah, it's like salt and vinegar. Popcorn, really? Mm -hmm. It's a great way of also making your popcorn a little bit wet so that the nutritional yeast and the salt will stick to it without drenching it in butter and oil. So you could even air, like if you were really avoiding oil, you could air pop your popcorn and then mist it with the apple cider vinegar and then put nutritional yeast and garlic salt on it and there you go, good popcorn. This is cold. I know it's gold, man. Blue corn chips. Well, you're probably wondering why blue corn chips and why not white or yellow or whatever. So blue corn chips are really 
the last of the corn that hasn't been touched by Monsanto. Mm. It is uh, almost all blue corn is going to be organic. Um, it's just not trendy enough, quite honestly. So keep it on the DL, but <laughs> buy the corn chips and the higher fiber content, the better. Um, also, uh, lots of people talk about eating by color. Now this does not mean Fruit Loops, obviously, but if you can somehow, you know, get in some purple potatoes in there, some blue corn, um, uh, blueberries are high, blueberries mixed to clove are the, the highest in antioxidant that you can possibly get. So every summer I make sure to pick up a butt ton of blueberries and then I keep them in my freezer. And um, I, I recently from the Buy Nothing Project got some popsicle molds and I've been having so much fun with popsicle molds. And I, I kind of wonder if the person who gifted them to me maybe regrets that because I sent her a picture and I was like, thank you so much. This one's got mango and coconut oil or coconut milk and, you know, uh, Concord grape juice with some blueberry and like, you know, I'm just really having fun with the popsicle molds. And I, I even thought that long after the, the heat wave was over that maybe I would get kind of tired of popsicles, but it's kind of a treat, you know, it's, it's better than ice cream. It's fun. They're fun to make. You know, and I think that um, it took me a while to feel this way, but the more you, like, you got this craving for potato chips. Oh, here's a trick. You got this craving for potato chips, go eat half of an avocado and then have some potato chips. I guarantee you that once you eat half that avocado, you might want a couple of potato chips to satisfy the crunchy, salty, da 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 da. But, um, you won't, you won't eat the whole bag, right? Your body, uh, you have cravings for a reason. Your cravings usually tell you, like, I've been craving peanuts and ice like crazy. Now, I don't know if there's a correlation there. Somebody told me recently that if you like to chew on ice, that you are iron deficient. And I always cook in my cast iron skillet, but I'm not very good about taking iron supplements because my mom was a supplement person. And so... Uh, I'd much rather do my best at trying to get my nutrition from my food, and I think I do a pretty good job of that. And I'm pretty in tune with um, when I do get a food craving, like figuring out what that food craving is. Um, so peanuts are high in iron, and um, so I've, I've just been eating peanuts lately. I don't remember even why I just brought that up, but somehow it's important. So blue corn chips is a, is a way of sneaking in some blue, some antioxidants, uh, bullion, um, or you could also put miso in there. I just got this red pepper and garlic miso from People's Food Co-op. It was $15 for the jar. But then you also have to look at the servings, okay? And there's like 15 servings per jar. So uh, don't be afraid of some things that are big prices. Um, this is a $24 bag of hemp seeds. And it might be like, whoa, $24 of hemp seeds. Um, but there's a lot of hemp seeds in here. And three tablespoons gives you 20% of your iron and 25% of your thiamine and 15% of your vitamin B6 and 10% of your folate and 50% of your phosphorus and 50% of your magnesium, and 20% of your zinc, and 25% of your copper, and 110% of manganese, not to mention omegas, okay? So three tablespoons, which means the three tablespoons that are in this rice, even if I don't eat all of that, all that grain salad in one sitting, every bite counts, right? Every time I put it inside a tortilla and add some pico de gallo and maybe some sauteed chanterelles and top it with some tahuti sour cream and some cilantro and eat it like a taco, I'm still getting all that stuff that I talked about just in smaller quantities. So, but you can sprinkle this on, I sprinkle this on my salads. Um, if I'm making, uh, you know, like date, cocoa, coconut, almond balls, you know, Noms, any noms, really. Hemp seeds, they pretty much go away and sprinkle them on your cereal if you eat cereal. 
Um, you can toss them in with your roasted root vegetables when they're, when they're done or when they're in there. Uh, you can put them in your banana bread. Lots of ways that you can use these. And this didn't actually cost $24. It's a $24 bag, but I got it at Grocery Outlet for $5. <laughs> so I bought three bags because they're fairly shelf stable if you don't open them, right? So, and because I use them all the time, they kind of, they, you know, they get used up, I eat them. Um, now these are hulled, which means they're not in the shell. Sometimes uh, places will have big giant bags of these that are in the shell, just like when the flax seed craze was going on, you could go and buy big huge bags of flax seed. Well, flax seed is great if you grind it or if you have it in the oil, but otherwise if you just eat flax seed, you just see it later. It's like, it's like corn, like kernel corn, right? So the best way to get nutrition from a flax seed is to grind it up, make sure that it's the meal or the oil, and not very helpful if you have a whole bag of it. Um, but I did see ones that were not shelled, and later experienced someone just eating them, just like eating them shell and all. And I thought it was a little weird, but then I tried it, and they were quite tasty. Um, this brand also makes uh, hemp seed oil, which is super high in omega-3s and a whole bunch of other good stuff, like all the stuff I mentioned. Um, and I, I, what do I do with that? I drizzle it on my popcorn. I drizzle it on like toast with nutritional yeast and some garlic salt for like a really nutty version of garlic bread. I don't know. I use it on salads. I put it on salads. Um, I drizzled some on some Brussels sprouts recently that I blanched. Um, I never liked Brussels sprouts, and then I finally figured out how I like them. If you trim down a Brussels sprout and almost cut it in half, like basically you're scoring it. You're scoring it. You're putting a little a little knife hole in there so that when you do blanch it, um, you're not overcooking the outside and undercooking the inside. You're kind of doing it all uniform. Um, so I find that trimmed and scored Brussels butterfly. sprouts, what? Butterfly. Butter, butterfly style. <laughs> Although I don't like them to fall apart because yeah, then no. you got halves no, again. Still connected. Yes. Butterfly. Mine don't butterfly open though, but I know what you're talking about. Anyway, I, I bring water to a boil. Uh, I put, I put the Brussels sprouts in there and I count one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, all the way to 10. And then I drain them and I drizzle some oil. Some people are anti-oil, that's fine, but um, I really like the hemp seed oil drizzled on that with some nutritional yeast and some salt, a little bit of black pepper on it. I can just mow down on Brussels sprouts. Can you roast with it? I mean, can you drizzle it with roast with that oil? Like hemp seed oil? Heat, you know. Um, it's not high like coconut oil, um, it's, it's more of a, you could probably roast because roasting is usually so, slow, you know, yeah. slow. and the longer you put stuff in the oven at a lower temperature for a longer period of time, the more caramelized and sweet and delicious it becomes. My favorite example of that is garlic scapes, which most people don't actively seek out garlic scapes, but I had a CSA and I got quite an education from all the different vegetables that came through my CSA and we would get garlic scapes. And yeah, I used to drizzle them in olive oil and just slow roast them until they just curled up into a, I mean, it's like candy. Garlic and sweet and so delicious, so delicious. I actually uh, recently had amaranth leaves at Food Not Bombs and put them in a salad and they were so delicious. They were nutty and we were all trying to figure out like what they were and they were bright fuchsia and had glitter on them and we were like eating the glitter. It's amazing what the earth produces and how beautiful everything is. So do you need to be sure you have whole hemp seeds too, just like you do? Um, I think that these are more versatile um, and if you don't enjoy the crunch and the flavor of eating the ones that are in the shell, um, you just can't do as much with those. I mean, that's kind of like pop it in your mouth and eat like popcorn, sort of like crunchy, nutty. Or you could, I suppose, sprinkle it on on the top of something. But I just think these are a lot more versatile, so I recommend these. Um, Nutiva also makes um, some, but.
quite honestly, I, yeah, I, I will splurge every once in a while, or as soon as I find um, a deal at grocery outlet, I'll buy like a few bags and they'll last me a pretty long time until the next sale. Um, bullion, I challenge all of you to go find a jar of, I almost bought one today and I was like, man, I don't really need bullion because I have this really great miso that I just got. But better than bullion is the brand. Most of them are animal based. Two of them are not. Make sure that the two that you grab are, are not. Uh, there's a, a, vet, a vegetable one, which is just vegetable broth, which I would never buy because, oh, oh, because um, when you're chopping your produce, your vegetables, your onions, your carrot butts, your celery butts, like anytime you're chopping any produce, instead of throwing it in the compost bin, get yourself a freezer bag, a Ziploc freezer bag, and or a, or a Tupperware container and put all your scraps in that container and when you're done chopping and doing whatever you're doing put it back in the freezer and when it's full dump it in a pot cover it with water bring it to a boil and simmer it for an hour and when it's at room temperature you've got broth and then you can stick it back in the freezer and freeze it for a time when you need broth <coughs> But all of those nutrients from the celery and carrot butts and the onion skins and all that stuff will go into that broth. And um, you might have to add salt to make it palatable as it is. Um, or maybe, you know, press some garlic into it or throw some bay leaves in it while it's simmering. Um, but that's extra nutrients and it will add flavor to your soups later. But the better than bullion, no chicken chicken is awesome. And it's particularly awesome for me personally. I only get it um, because I like having it in my cupboard when I'm sick. Now I'm rarely sick, so I don't really eat it very much. Um, but every once in a while I want chicken noodle soup. And you can have chicken noodle soup easily with that stuff. It, it's unbelievable. It's just made from vegetables, but it tastes just like chicken soup. It's just like chicken bouillon. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, Bulk beans, I get these from, I get them for free. I mean, I, I don't know when the last time I bought beans was. I, people in my building put cans of beans that are organic, that are just fine, but maybe they have an ex, expiration date. I don't know. I, I just seem to have, I'm uh, gifted with beans often. Um, hello. Okay. Um, buy nothing project. People give away beans often. I have lots of beans from buy nothing project. But you can buy them in bulk. Again, they're on sale. Buy them in bulk. Put them in a jar. Um, there are a few articles online that I encourage you to go seek out and read so you can make your own decision about whether you have to soak them or not. There is new evidence that shows soaking doesn't really do anything except maybe speed up your cooking time. So if you're in a hurry, then maybe it's helpful to soak them, but you still would have had to remember that last night. You know what I mean? So if you're not good at thinking in stages like that, it's just a lot easier to put the beans in a crock pot and cover them with water and turn it on and then leave, go to work, come home later and then have beans. That might work out better for you. Um, Chickpeas also, because you can do so much with chickpeas. Um, obviously hummus is, is the easy one. But the other thing that chickpeas are good for in here, if you food process them really, really well, and you add some celery and maybe some water chestnuts, if you like that sort of thing, anything that you would normally put in tuna salad. And this is like one of my favorite things in the wide world. You can get this at the Asian market too. I swear I just go to the Asian market for like six things. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things. And I'll pass this around if you want to taste it. Um, there are different brand or different varieties of the same thing. Most of them have bonito or dashi or some fish something in them. This one does not. All this is is sesame seeds, salt, sugar, and seaweed. 
And when you add this to chickpeas that have been processed with celery and all the things that you would normally find in tuna fish, it's surprising how much like tuna fish it tastes like. Wow. So here, keep the cap on, but you can pass that around and, and sample that. Um, lentils totally don't need to be soaked. soaked. They're really fast cooking things. Um, if you're gonna watch a movie, go put some lentils on <laughs> and go watch your movie. If you put on the flame low enough, you know, when you take your break halfway through the movie, your lentils should be done. Um, so they store really well. You can mix them in with a green salad that you've already made. Um, you can make lentil soup with them. There's just, there's just such, and, and red lentils are so very different from brown or black beluga or the French green. Um, I encourage you to experiment with them. The red ones cook very quickly, and that's uh, a great base for dal um, with potatoes and carrots and ginger and maybe a little bit of coconut milk, and you can pour that over rice or scoop it up with bread. Um, there's lots of recipes online for dal, and most of them are already vegan without you typing in vegan doll, but I'm sure that would come up with a million of them too. Um, and dried and yellow uh, and green, bulk dried yellow and split peas um, <coughs> are also, I'm a big fan of split pea soup. One of the things I love to do with split pea soup is grate some lemon zest at the very end. So when all of your split pea soup is done, I just grate some lemon zest in there and I love it. It's like, it wakes up and gives a brightness to split pea soup that was not there before. Um, a lot of people have a hard time thinking, even thinking of split pea soup without thinking of a ham hock or some sort of meaty substance, right? Um, and that's one of the reasons why coconut bacon exists in my world. So I will also have you pass this one around. So all this is, is basically all bacon is, is the flavor profile of bacon has been infused into a fat source. And all I'm doing is swapping out the fat source. And instead of using the soft underbelly of a pig, I'm using coconut. You made this? Mm -hmm. I did. So all bacon is, is smoke, salt, sugar, crunch, and fat. Basically, so um, wow, I know, right? If you take if you take some really good bread and toast it and put veganaise or just mayo on it and then sprinkle that coconut bacon, it kind of adheres to the mayonnaise and then you put sprouts and avocado and tomato and lettuce and squish it all together and eat it. It's really like the best BLT ever, 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 and it's totally plant based and you don't there's nothing you don't miss anything. I don't miss anything. It's really. Um, mm. It might taste more coconutty, like here coming out of the jar, but once you <coughs> the flavor profile with all the other flavors of lettuce and tomato, and you don't even have to have sprouts and avocado, but I certainly do appreciate those things in my sandwich. Hmm, that's good. How did you make that? What's the, what are the seasonings? Um, I'm. Do I I do remember. I also signed an NDA with the um, Portland State University. Uh, School of Business, um, and when my number is up and they call me, I will have successfully hired the entire School of Business to work for me for 12 weeks to do something with that and some other things that I have going on. So um, I encourage you to experiment with your own, like if you wanted to make coconut teriyaki, um, I will tell you. So you put it in the seasonings. You put seasonings. Yeah, you're basically you're basically making a marinade, mm -hmm. and then you're marinating the coconut coconut chips, mm -hmm. and then you're putting it in a on a cookie sheet, and you're sticking it in the oven um, at like 325 for like five minutes, and then take it out, mix it up, and then five minutes, and then take it out, mix it up, you know. And you can do it with all kinds of different, uh, you know, teriyaki or all kinds of different things. In fact. Um, I haven't experimented with this, and I don't know if this would work, but I certainly would like to. Um, I'm really bad about keeping certain certain things that I know I love to cook with around, like a kefir lime or some lemongrass or ginger. You know, like I get excited and I buy some fresh ginger, 
and then it and then it withers away in my basket. So I love this because I can go to uh, Cash and Carry is the other secret shopping spot. Cash and Carry, but I don't know, maybe this was five bucks, but it has a um, hundred servings per container. What is it? So. What is it? I know. So it's yellow curry paste, but all it is is lemongrass, garlic, shallot, salt, galangal, dried red chili, coriander seed, kefir lime peel, cumin, cinnamon, mace, turmeric, and cardamom. These are all good things. They're anti-inflammatory. They're good for digestion. You can take a spoonful of this and mix it in with some coconut milk and make a, and make a sauce and then add that to your lentils and experiment with it. Um, a little goes a long way. It's really like mashed up paste. You can pass this around too, if I get it open. I mean, it smells, you can smell it. Isn't that great? And you can use so much stuff with that. Um, yeah, one of these days I'm gonna have a class that's like ways that you can fix, how to fix the soup. Um, that's one of the ways that I might fix the soup if it's lacking something and I think that it's a flavor profile that would work with that. Um, <clears throat> coconut oil and coconut milk, high in MCTs, medium chain triglycerides. Um, it is an oil, it is fat, you know, and a lot of people decide that they want to try to go oil free and you can certainly do that. There's lots of ways to cut out oil as, as we mentioned. I mean, you can air pop and then use the apple cider vinegar, for example, on your popcorn. Um, but I like coconut oil. I do a lot of things with it. Um, it is definitely instrumental in the coconut bacon. Um, and coconut milk, uh, it's mushroom season right now. And one of the things I like to do during mushroom season, besides hunt mushrooms, is eat them. And first you have to cook them, right? And one of the things I love to make is chowder. If you find chicken of the woods, then um, chicken of the woods is a, is a mushroom that tastes and looks just like chicken. It breaks apart like a cooked chicken breast and you can dice it up and make a chicken risotto and you would never know that there's not chicken in there. Wow. Lobster mushroom is actually a poisonous mushroom that has been taken over by a fungus. And when it gets taken over by this fungus, it actually renders the poisonous mushroom not poisonous anymore and gives it the smell, flavor, taste, and consistency of lobster. And I love to make lobster mushroom like bisque. It's so good. Uh, the chanterelles, I recently made a chowder with chanterelles and coral mushrooms. You have to be careful with corals. If you consume too many of corals, you will have to go to the bathroom a whole bunch. <laughs> so that was something that I learned in my experimenting with mushrooms. But I just find that coconut milk at the end of a soup, at the end of a doll, at the end of these things, makes a really good finishing touch. It brings out creaminess. If you're making mashed potatoes and you want some creamy and all you have is vanilla soy milk and that's not going to do it, <laughs> it's really good to have coconut milk in your cupboard. Now this is not coconut milk, this is coconut cream, and it's a hard block. And if you keep it in your fridge, you can take it out of the packaging, and you can use a grater, and you can grate a hard block of coconut cream on top of anything, which also adds a, you know, like we're used to grating Parmesan or whatever. I mean, people get into their, um, it's, and it's not just, it's not just texture, it's not just flavor, it's not just mouthfeel. It's habitual, right? We just, we, we like doing these things that we've done for maybe our whole lives, right? And so I find that coconut cream satisfies some urge to grate on top of roasted root vegetables or the finishing touch on a soup or whatever. I'm a foodie, I can't help it. Um, you can also put this in some hot water and it gets all goopy and comes out goopy. Um, you do have to refrigerate it and you should kind of use it within a week's time period, maybe a little bit longer. Um, I definitely press the limit on many, like expiration dates sometimes I think are just, they're, they're really there for liability reasons. Right. They've got to put some expiration date on it. So these people that give me their organic beans that have expiration dates, 
Um, very few expired cans I've ever opened didn't sit well, and the ones that didn't sit well were, it was very obvious. Um, there's also a container that looks very similar to this that I did not bring with me tonight because I don't have any at home. It's coconut milk that comes in a box that you can buy for 99 cents at the Asian market, and you can get it for $1.99 other places, but it's called A Roy D. A R O Y dash D. I like this size, I like it better than a can of coconut milk. I like the texture. Uh, it's from Thailand. Uh, it just tastes really good to me. Um, this is an organic product. I don't know that Aroy D coconut milk is organic. Lots of coconut stuff is not organic. Um, these coconut chips come from, new, uh, from Whole Foods and they don't have organic coconut chips. So sometimes you just can't get organic coconut I don't know that that means they spray them with pesticides. They just don't have a certified organic, you know what I mean? Like, and there's certain things like apples, you're gonna eat an apple, skin and all, most of the time. So it's really important to have organic apples, in my opinion. Organic coconut, I'm not too concerned. You gotta get past all the stuff inside to get the meat and not, not terribly concerned about that. I have to pick my battles. But Aroy D, I like it because it's like a little carton and I can use a little bit like either in my serving or in like the little bit of doll. I mean, I'm only cooking for me right. and uh, a few portions later. You know what I mean? I'm not cooking for a big family. So depending on what you need, you might appreciate the can. But the can is too much for me. And I end up pouring, it, pouring whatever's left over, which is usually a lot, in a container. And it's more apt to go bad. It, it just seems to spoil a lot faster. Whereas what I do with, if this were my coconut oil, is I would use what I need and I would fold the box down and I clip it with a little binder clip and I stick it in a plastic bag and I zip it and it it's all contained and then anytime I need like a little bit of coconut milk to add to my garlic roasted garlic mashed potatoes and parsnips or whatever I got going on I just feel like I it just works for me a little bit better so maybe it'll work for you a bit better. Do you find that um, products like the, the coconut milk and Rice milk and soy milk are cheaper at the Asian markets versus... Sometimes. Grocery outlet is usually where I get my nut and seed milks um, because they seem to have the best price and there's always something that's cheaper than any of the other places. When I have to compare, like, I don't have a car. So the time and energy it takes for me to go to these places and the amount of stuff that I really want to buy and carry home, um, I just, I pick what's important to me and that's usually little boxes of coconut milk and um, I don't know what else I mentioned, but I haven't actually gone to the Asian market in forever. Toasted nori, I get the big sheets of toasted nori from the Asian market because it's cheaper mm -hmm. and it's a lot less packaging than buying the little seaweed snacks even from Trader Joe's. It's an affordable price at Trader Joe's. but. I always open it up and then I want to eat the whole thing and I don't need to eat the whole thing and so uh, it's easier for me to get the big sheets and then I, I cut them up and stick them in a little reusable sandwich baggie or, or I eat a sheet and then I put it back in my cupboard. And I love the, but where did this stuff go? Yeah, this stuff. Did we like this? What did you think of this? It was good. Uh, it's good. when you're mixing it again with the mayonnaise and the chickpeas and the celery and the whatever, like it. It really makes it tuna fish. It's really, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Good. It just, like it just says it's a rice seasoning. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so just on your, on your rice. Um, while we're talking about that, this is another one of my favorite things ever. I just filled this up today because I used this <coughs> crazy. In fact, it, it was also in this. Uh, this is called Mont Monterey. Uh, or Montreal steak seasoning. I don't eat steak, but I put it on everything. And all it is is coarse, gra dehydrated, granulated garlic, salt, black pepper, and red pepper. And I invite you to sprinkle some on your hand and just taste it. Whether you sprinkle it on vegetables, while you put it in a green salad, basically anytime I need salt, I probably need a little bit of pepper. 
and I probably need a little bit of crushed red pepper and, you know, I'll throw some garlic in there too. So it's got all of the things I need. It's the best thing to... You made this? No, 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 you buy it. I buy that at Sheridan's also in bulk. Um, sprinkled on tomatoes is amazing. Um, I learned that uh, Vitopian, which is the vegan cheese shop a couple of doors down from this studio, has um, fresh mozzarella, vegan mozzarella, and with um, tomatoes and basil and a little bit of olive oil and a sprinkle of that. Mm, yummy. What was that called? Vitopian? Vitopia? No, oh, that's Montreal there. steak seasoning. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Chicken seasoning. I like it because it's not spicy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm a, yeah, I'm a spiceaholic. Yeah, we like spicy. We like spicy. Um, I got to keep going here or I'm going to not have enough time. <laughs> um, so uh, the next thing on the list is condiments. You know, I, I don't usually make complicated things at home. I save those for special, special going out. Um, so, you know, grain salads and steamed chard and, you know, sometimes I get crazy and make special tacos or whatever, but um, my stuff is pretty basic. Condiments make it exciting. Uh, if you go to a grocery outlet and you find some you know, spiced Indian mango chutney, and it sounds appealing to you, and it's 99 cents, buy it, take it home, experiment it, mix it up with some rice, or, you know, what does it taste like uh, to change the flavor profile of a soup? But by the way, I highly recommend that no matter what condition your soup starts out in, like when it's done, uh, before you, don't season it. Don't flavor it or season it. Just, you know, get the get the veggies and the, the peas and the beans and the whatever in the pot. Cover it with water. Simmer it. Get it to however you like it. And then season it later. And you can ladle out stuff. Like, put, put a couple of ladles in a bowl. And then play with that bowl. Until you get a flavor profile that's like, oh my god, this is it. You know, I needed a little bit of coconut milk. And I needed a little bit of... You know, maybe whatever you ended up making, you know, used coconut milk and you had some of this in it and then you threw some of that Indian mango chutney in there and it threw it over the edge, you know what I mean? But once you get this tasting delicious, then put the, then add to the pot, right? Because if whatever combination you're playing with goes right in the pot and it's not a flavor combination that, like, you know, you accidentally, you put, you're like, oh yeah, Bragg's in... And coconut milk, mm, no. Rags and coconut milk, not typically a combination that'll work, but it might, I don't know. But I'm just saying that once you taint the, you know, once the pot is, you know, then you gotta resurrect the pot. You gotta fix, fix that. Whereas if you're playing with just a bowl, and even a bowl smaller than this, like one little scoop, you can really um, experiment well with that, okay. So condiments, yeah, have fun with condiments. I love, for spicy people, I love chili garlic sauce. It's a jar, it has a rooster on it, it's not sriracha, because sriracha has a lot of sugar in it, although I'm out of the chili garlic sauce, so I'm trying to use up my sriracha, but uh, Cash and Carry also carries the rooster chili garlic sauce, which I also put in everything. And it's cheap at Cash and Carry, super cheap. And the rice noodles, rice noodles are also cheaper, at, or cheap at cash and carry. I'd rather bike down to cash and carry from where I live than take the bus all the way out to Fubon because mm -hmm. I'll also maybe buy stuff I don't need. But you know, you can, I don't know. I think the only thing I don't have a lot of is like toasted nori. Um, but I'm starting to see this other places. And so when I find it, I buy it. Like I think I got this at Sheridan's. Mm -hmm. So if I can buy it at Sheridan's, mm -hmm. it might be more expensive than Fubon, but it's right down the street. So I'm not expending the time. Time is money and the bus fare and all that other stuff to go way out there. So, um, dried fruit, okay, so I dehydrate everything. I don't know if y'all got some of that, the dehydrated candy right here. Yeah. Um, there are dehydrated Asian pears in here that I put in the salad. Um, you can also, uh, quinoa and amaranth and Bob's Red Mill, seven grain breakfast cereal 
if you're into breakfast cereals, you can make a lot and then in the, you know, put it in, the, in a Tupperware container and stick it in your fridge. And you've got four or five servings for every morning that week. And you, know, you take a scoop out and you put it in your bowl and some people like it cold, some people like it hot. If you have a microwave, you can heat it up in the microwave. If you don't, you can, I use my toaster oven for everything that everyone else uses their microwave oven for. So I just, I just take a spatula and break it up on my toaster oven and, and put it on a few toasty cycles. And then I put it in the bowl and I cover it with some rice milk and scissor in some, uh, some dried fruit and put a dollop of jam in there or whatever, whatever, you know, tasty combination works for you. Quinoa is interesting if you, if you bring the water to a boil and then add the quinoa in and then put the lid on and reduce and simmer. You will end up with fluffy quinoa that's like couscous kind of consistency. But if you put the quinoa and the water in the pot together and bring it to a boil together and reduce it and simmer it with the lid on, then you get more like hot cereal consistency. It's much more breakfast cereal type result as opposed to savory fluffy grain grain cereal stuff uh, there's no quinoa in here there's millet and then basmati rice in there and a little bit of uh, long grain wild rice in here um, and the millet millet has a very corn kind of flavor i'm jumping ahead because it's all down there somewhere but um uh, i like to toast the millet a little bit in a hot pan before before I do the rest. Um, it brings out its kind of nutty corn flavor to before it. Before it's cooked? I mean before like, Yeah, in other words, I've got my pan, and I turn the heat on and I let it get hot. And I go grab my millet and I pour it into my cup and I put it in the hot pan and then I just kind of swirl it around. I'm basically toasting it. It's so that my grain doesn't end up mush. Right. Right? It's kind of how I do it. Yeah, that with millet. Pardon? I've had mush with millet. Yeah, mush with millet? No, no bueno. I don't like it. Right. Uh, it doesn't make a good breakfast cereal either. It's not my favorite. Quinoa makes a good breakfast cereal. Amaranth? I don't, I don't love amaranth. I haven't quite figured out how to love it yet. Um, but it all just takes, you know, playing with and figuring out what your taste preference is. I do like quinoa hot cereal and I do like Bob's Red Mill the seven grain or whatever it is. And it's filling and it's complex carbohydrates and it like gets me through my morning. At some point before we go, can you just comment a little bit on gluten? On gluten? <laughs> sure, I would love to comment on gluten. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> um, so, um, dehydrator, Excalibur, Nine Tray, save up your money. It's really worth it. I don't have one. I have a big monster that's terribly inefficient and has window screens in it. And it was given to me and it's free and so I'll take it. But an Excalibur is great, it's square. A lot of the dehydrators are round and so the heating element, instead of it being in the back, it's in the middle. So there's all this wasted space and you might have different tiers, but you have to like take a bunch of tiers off in order to like rotate your trays and Excalibur, you just open it up and slide the individual trays out. It's so much easier to use. Um, I've only given you just a taste of what you can do. The, the juice uh, fiber crackers is another thing. Um, I recently went to Burning Man. I wasn't sure what I was going to eat at Burning Man this year. It was the first time I had been back to Burning Man in many years, and it was the first time as a vegan. And one of the things that I did was I marinated and dehydrated lots of things. So I marinated and dehydrated thin sliced sweet walla walla onions in like a teri teriyaki marinade and then dehydrated them. And they became long stringy sort of like shoestring potatoes but shoestring onions. And I did the same with portobello mushrooms and that same marinade and people wondered what I was eating because they would smell, they would smell something that, you know, and it was, um, I had ranch flavored kale chips, 
uh, marinated portobello mushrooms, marinated sweet walla walla onions, sun-dried tomatoes, and coconut bacon, like as a, like as a savory trail mix. And I walked around Burning Man and, and ate this out of this bag, and people were like everywhere. It was like, what are you eating? And I'd give them a piece of portobello mushroom, and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing what you can do with a dehydrator. I just, yeah, I love mine. Uh, falafel mix. There's a falafel mix that's gluten-free at Sheridan's in the bulk bin that's 100% fava beans, no chickpeas, because true falafel is not chickpea, it's fava. Really? And um, it's really simple to mix with water, and you can make them whatever size, ball, shape, pancake you want. And I like to put them in my toaster oven, and I just use a basting brush, and I baste them lightly with olive oil and flip them over every once in a while. And then I put them in a container and I store them in my fridge. So you can make a whole bunch at one time. It's really inexpensive, particularly in bulk. I have an entire jar at home on my fridge dedicated to falafel mix. Because it's one of those things that like, if I get home and I make a big salad and I just need a little extra something, I can crumble falafel on top of my salad. Um, if I have some tortillas and I want to Put it all together like a tortilla wrap with lettuce and tomato and maybe some, you know, um, tahini sauce or whatever, cucumber sauce. Um, I'm amazed at what they're doing with coconut yogurt, particularly the Greek style coconut yogurt is so good um, without all the whey byproduct that is uh, not only good for our, not, not only bad for our bodies, but bad for the environment because whey is such a huge um, waste product of the dairy industry and Greek yogurt has a ton of it. So, uh, environmentally speaking, better to choose coconut in many ways than, than not. Um, garlic. Uh, I probably go through one to two heads per week. Maybe that's a lot. No, I don't know if it is. I kind of start almost everything I make with garlic and onion. Um, and, um, I really prefer the fresh, hard, solid head that I peel myself. Um, I know a lot of people like to buy the jars of the pre minced but it's not just about flavor, it's about nutrition. And um, the sooner you process something, the sooner it starts de decomposing and deteriorating. In some ways that's good, like if you're doing cultured vegetables and you chop up a bunch of cabbage and you stick it in a crock and you keep pounding it down to make sure that it's underneath its water and eventually you've got sauerkraut. And you've got all of the bacteria and things that's good for your gut in the way that traditional kimchi or sauerkraut is made. But uh, as far as garlic is concerned, I want to start with a fresh clove and have to peel it and press it in my garlic presser. Um, it's really superior nutritionally. Um, flavor-wise, and it's just, uh, yeah, so that's my suggestion. Um, herbal teas, you know, a lot of times late at night, it's really nice to have some herbal teas, and um, I don't drink a lot of caffeinated tea because caffeine is really not, my body doesn't love caffeine, but it's, uh, oolong is what I drink the most of, and oolong's oxidation process is completely different from black, green, and white tea. Um, and it often requires the assistance of some sort of bug. Like the oxidation process doesn't start until it gets bit by a beetle or something like that. There's some just really fascinating things about oolong tea. But the oxidation process somehow changes how our bodies can tolerate the caffeine and oolong tea than the other teas. Um, doo -doo -doo, Bob's Red Mill, love it. If you've not, they have some really amazing vegan <clears throat> breakfast bread at Bob's Red Mill. Uh, I kind of, it was like, it was called like vegan breakfast loaf or something like that. And it was really delicious. Like as far as like a, a toast in the morning that you might put some stuff on and eat apple butter or whatever, really good. Um, lemons and limes, good for water, good for zesting into soups, um, squeezing on top of tacos. We talked about ginger. Liquid smoke, that's what I use in the coconut bacon to get that smoky flavor. I also love smoked salts. Um, smoked salts are great for also adding the split pea soup. 
I would use the liquid smoke in a marinade. I would not necessarily add it to a soup. A little goes a long way with the liquid smoke. Question? Um, maple syrup or sugar. You see there's a V on there. I don't know if you know, uh, most sugar, uh, well, most sugar is inflammatory. Um, white cane sugar is filtered through bone char. And bone char is a big pile of leftover product from the animal industries. So I don't really eat a lot of sugar because that's my trigger for my skin issues and for my digestion. Maple syrup is pretty much the thing that I have in my cupboard. Um, it seems to work for everything. I can make candied walnuts with maple syrup. I can make coconut bacon with maple syrup. I can drizzle maple syrup on my cereal if I need it to be sweeter. I have molasses also, blackstrap molasses in my cupboard, and I usually use maple syrup and blackstrap molasses um, uh, a lot. And I do have a bag of vegan sugar and I think I got it at grocery outlet for cheap. Um, and that's what I use for making my own kombucha. And that's what I use for um, baking if I'm not also adding like bananas. I think I use bananas a lot for baking and sweetness because I'm often making banana bread, but also any, any sort of muffin, you can add uh, a really ripe uh, okay, here's a thing. You see a bag of bananas at Sheridan's occasionally. They'll put $2 on it and they're all bruised and brown. I get a bunch of them from uh, Food Not Bombs. I bring them home. I peel them. I put them in a freezer bag. I freeze them. Uh, they easily go into my blender for smoothies. They easily defrost just fine sitting in a bowl while I'm mixing the other banana bread ingredients mm -hmm. in. But if you take frozen bananas out of the freezer and put them immediately into your cute little food processor like this, and you pulse it and keep pulsing it until you have ice cream, and you add a little bit of dollop of your Aroy D coconut milk that's in your fridge, and maybe crumble some walnuts in there or throw some cacao nibs in there, uh, or not. Uh, it makes really good banana ice cream, frozen bananas in a processor. So uh, I encourage you to experiment with that. Um, nutritional yeast, I don't know if any of you haven't tried it straight up, I'll pass it around. I buy it in bulk. It's good stuff. Um, I used to be the one in college and beyond that had the extra tall green Kraft American cheese, Parmesan cheese Ooh. container. And I dumped it on everything. So I think it was a little challenging for me to be like, what do you mean I can't have Parmesan cheese? Or not that I didn't, that I couldn't have it, but that I was choosing not to have it. But I definitely was looking for something that would mimic the mouthfeel and that stuff. I can't even tell you, it's really hard if you're not familiar with nutritional yeast to wrap your head around all the ways that it's utilized. There is a really good recipe online that is extra creamy vegan mac and cheese. I'm pretty sure that if you type in extra creamy with the vegan and the mac and cheese, you'll get this recipe. It's a five-star recipe. It's unbelievable. A little bit of a little bit of soaked cashews and a little bit of nutritional yeast and a little bit of lemon juice and a little bit of simmered potato and carrot and onion with the broth thrown in a blender with a few other ingredients makes the most decadent vegan cheese sauce that you could possibly use some garlic in there. You can use it in Alfredo sauce, like making Alfredo sauce. You could type in vegan Alfredo sauce. It's, it's really with some very simple ingredients that you have in your jars and your cover, you can really make all kinds of things. And nutritional yeast is a huge staple. One of the things I was going to make tonight and I didn't have time is the really easy kale salad that you can get at Whole Foods. But instead of buying at Whole Foods, 
it's really cheap to buy kale, especially if it's on sale, and you can get one bunch of green kale and pick it off of all the stems, put it in a bowl, and it's like two tablespoons of Bragg's, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, two tablespoons of lemon juice, a pressed garlic clove, four tablespoons of nutritional yeast. Am I missing anything? Mix it all up. Oh, two tablespoons of tahini. And it's tahini, garlic, lemon, Bragg's apple cider, and nutritional yeast that makes this amazing, really strongly flavored, garlicky flavored, cheesy flavored, tahini flavored stuff on, that you take your hands and really like massage it into your kale. And the acids in the lemon juice and the acids in the Bragg's, the acids break down the fibers in that raw kale, which makes it so much more palatable than just picking up raw kale and chewing on it. You feel like you're a cow. And I'm sure cows enjoy their grass, but um, it, kale's not palatable for everyone. It takes a while to figure out that you have, you have to cook it or steam it or at least get those things in there and break down those fibers. And then you'll, what you'll find is you'll have this huge container of kale salad, right? And you'll put the lid on it and stick it in the fridge. And you'll come back a couple hours later and you pull the lid off. And what used to be this much will be like this much. <laughs> it's really concentrated salad. But the cool thing is, is that it becomes an ingredient. So like if you're making tacos and you take a little pinch of that garlic, lemon, tahini, kale salad, you can put that in your taco and it will flavor it will it will give you flavors like uh you know if you have a rice bowl and you have other steamed veggies but you didn't really add a lot of seasoning you can take a few pinches of that kale salad and mix it up in there and it's really a, just a nice thing to always have in your fridge it's like one of my staples kale salad question apple cider and lemon juice yeah apple cider vinegar Apple cider vinegar, lemon juice, Bragg's, tahini, nutritional yeast, garlic. I think it's seven ingredients, including the kale. Um, well, wait, I missed one then. Uh, Bragg's, vinegar, lemon juice, garlic, nutritional yeast, tahini, kale. Oh, and kale. <laughs> and kale. Okay. And I, I like using the curly green kale, but you can you can use any of the kale. I mean, the, the red kale or the Dino, otherwise known as Tuscan. It's the stuff that looks like a dinosaur leaf. Yeah, like if it was big. The last one. Um, the reason why I brought these two bottles with with me, there's lots of soy products out there, and there's a lot of conversation about soy being bad for us, et cetera, et cetera. Certain soys are better than other soys. Cultured and fermented soy is easier to digest so we can assimilate everything. Um, liquid aminos, uh, a half a teaspoon has 160 milligrams of sodium. And, and this has, this, this says it's one tablespoon, but it has 910 milligrams of sodium. So the serving size is different, but this is just vegetable protein from soybeans and water. That's all this is. And that's not what this is. Although this is from whole soybeans and it is organic, but this is just regular soy sauce. And the sodium difference is huge, but this doesn't really have any extra in it, right? Like it, it, it tells you 38% of your daily recommended sodium in one tablespoon of soy sauce. Whereas this one, yeah, I don't know. This one has one gram of protein. This one has 310 milligrams of protein. Um, but it has all of your, your enzymes in it. It's gonna help break down the food that you're eating. So, I, if you want to, I'll pass this around. You can uncork them and smell them and, and, you know, and know too that like, I mean, I still have both those things in my cupboard. So sometimes I really do want soy sauce 
And um, sometimes I, most of the time I use brags. I use brags for all kinds of things, really for marinades, for dressings. Um, marinades and dressings, Because mm -hmm. I'm always marinating and dressing my food. Whole food with marinade. Um, it's 8.42, okay. So uh, we talked about that, we talked about that. Nuts and nut butters. Um, we talked about Oregon walnuts. We talked about um, so <coughs> all raw. When we roast or otherwise heat nuts and seeds, we close the pores and we make it really hard to digest. Like we already don't chew as much as we should chew, right? We already don't salivate as much as we should salivate because American culture has shifted from making our own food to going out and buying our own food at restaurants. Someone else is, is cooking it. Um, we need to get back to making more of our own food because digestion starts with chopping and sauteing. You know, when that first initial garlic gets thrown in the pan, those smells, they don't just smell good. They're, they're your, the signal to your body to say, oh, we better start making those digestive enzymes. And some things take a lot of digestive enzymes to break down, like animal protein, for example, takes a lot to break down. We are chewing less and still consuming a whole lot of stuff. So um, uh, I actually recommend, at least for me, it was really important for me to heal my digestion and heal my skin through taking digestive enzymes. I took them for a long time because I had a lot of healing to do, but even transitioning into eating more fibrous foods, it's helpful to give yourself a boost. Now, pre and probiotics is a different thing entirely. We're talking about the digestive enzymes that our body should be creating to help break down the food so that before it goes through our gut, it's, it's broken down uh, so it travels smoothly. Um, if your gut is already irritated and you're eating food and, and your, your di digestive uh, process is not sufficient, then two things happen. Not only does it go through your digestion irritating everything further, but an irritated gut doesn't absorb the nutrients, which is what we need to heal. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. So I highly recommend digestive enzymes. Um, I'm, a, I'm a doTERRA girl, so doTERRA makes a really good digestive enzyme that I order monthly for myself, um, although not every month, but I'm not taking it at every meal. For a while, I was taking it every single time I put food in my mouth. I was taking digestive enzymes, and they helped tr tremendously. Um, I didn't really, I won't go into the big story, but like I had some serious skin issues, like where I didn't have skin like anywhere on my leg and my foot for a while. And I had eczema and psoriasis and chronic dermatitis and I was bleeding through my shirts and I had deep cracks in my hands and I've really gory nasty pictures if you want to see it. But that's what started this whole process of educating myself and, um, digestive enzymes anyway, were key in healing that. I don't have... I don't have skin problems anymore. Um, so uh, nuts, when they're raw, the pores are open. When pores are open, moisture can get in. Uh, digestive enzymes can get in, and it helps break everything down. Uh, the other thing that happens is that our, our register for feeling full comes at an efficient, appropriate time when you're eating raw nuts. But when you're eating roasted, salted, mixed nuts in a can at the Super Bowl party and you get that, oh my God, I ate too much nuts feeling, um, that's because our trigger isn't aware of the roasted nuts because they don't expand in our belly in the same way. And before you know it, you, just, you got nut gut. Nut gut's bad. Are you, are you feeling me? Have, has everybody experienced nut gut before? It's really uncomfortable. It's really, really uncomfortable. Um, it can also, honestly, it can also cause problems elsewhere, right? Because people who do have diverticulitis or are susceptible to uh, perforated colons and, you know, things getting stuck and infections starting and stuff like nuts and seeds tend to be, you know, 
part of the problem. So that's why it's important to chew and um, raw stuff uh, as often as possible. Um, now, I put olive oil, flax oil, hemp oil, sesame oil. Sesame oil adds a flavor profile to dressings and marinades that you're not going to get any other way. You can get it toasted or you can get it raw. Um, and they have a different flavor profile, even the toasted and the raw ones. If you ever want to um, uh, play with oils, there's a place called Benassier. It's right around the corner near South Park Restaurant, near the park blocks at Salmon and 7th, 8th. Um, they have vinegars and oils galore. And you can go in and like go around and sample them. And they have dark chocolate balsamic, which goes really good on strawberries, by the way. And um, I also like to put dark chocolate balsamic on bananas and then dehydrate them. Um, they also have porcini oil in there and white truffle oil and just all kinds of things. So um, the, uh, I think there was a lemongrass mint vinegar that I got once and made a bunch of amazing dressing with. So um, I've kind of learned now how to like play or manipulate my own stuff at home using the whole ingredients that I get. <clears throat> but if you want to skip that step and just have more oils and vinegars, uh, more variety in your cupboards to choose from, um, it's kind of one of those things like maybe $10 a bottle, but uh, you know, you use it a little bit of here and a little bit of there and it lasts a long time. But Nessier? And that French, so I can't really help you with how that's spelled. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so quinoa, millet, barley, wheat, berries, couscous. Okay, let's take let's take some time and talk about gluten for a second. So um, overly high bread, overly processed. This is an opinion piece, by the way. Well, this is an opinion piece. Um, a really processed, a really hybrid, uh, overly consumed American wheat is a, a simple carbohydrate that doesn't really do much for us nutritionally. Um, people aren't feeling well. Everyone's on a no gluten paleo kick, so they decide that they start to see maybe even a pattern that, oh, I ate that pizza last night, or oh, I had that bread, or oh, it must have been the crackers and cheese at the party, or whatever. And so they stop eating gluten. Well, when they stop eating gluten, they stop eating cereal, pancakes, waffles, sandwiches, pasta, garlic bread, pie, right? Pizza. The list goes on and on because over-processed over hybrid GMO American wheat is in everything, right? So, but what else is in all those things? Well, with the pancakes and the waffles, they got rid of syrup. They got rid of maybe the butter that was on top. Um, the pizza, they got rid of the sauce and the sugar that was in the sauce and the cheese that was on the pizza. Um, the sandwich, the luncheon meat that's preserved with nitrates and sulfites. Um, in other words, they're sure they probably feel better. Anybody would feel better. Stop eating all of that as much as we're eating it in a single day. How many servings of wheat are we? Is the average standard American diet consuming every day? But then all the other inflammatory things that were along with that and cheese. What what does what does cheese have that's nutritional? Um, okay, well it has all that animal protein, but uh, but that just fills us up with fat. It doesn't fill us up with nutrition. So I can eat like a huge salad like Elaine and Seinfeld and I can just eat it all day long if I feel like grazing or I feel like just, you know, sometimes we just want to consume. I would rather consume a big giant bowl of Asian noodle soup than a piece of pizza. <clears throat> so um, does that mean that people aren't affected by gluten? No, certainly I think that there's good reason to cut out 10 servings of gluten a day. Um, does that mean that you should give up bread forever? 
No, I don't, I don't think that that is, uh, I, I mean, I think that the gluten-free thing is a necessary transition to eliminate <coughs> certain things from our plate and hopefully concentrating on the stuff that's nutrient dense. Unfortunately, because we're a culture that doesn't know how to cook and doesn't know how to shop and, or maybe they buy some kale and they take it home and then they look at it and they stick it in the crisper drawer and they shut it and then they never see it again until they smell something awful and then they pull it out and it's all drippy and, um, it's much easier to go to the barbecue or to have someone else in the household go to the barbecue who's really excited about going to the barbecue. And then that ends up filling up not only most of the space on the plate, but most of the belly room, right? We feel satisfied when we eat sometimes a lot of the things that come from the barbecue. Now granted, there's lots of things you can put on the barbecue. And if you ever want to know about grilling vegetables, I highly recommend going to Harvest at the Bindery, which is a fairly pricey vegan restaurant that is on Sandy and 34th-ish. And they have marinated grilled kale and grilled sweet potatoes and a white bean garlic aioli sauce and like they do things with vegetables that you just didn't know was possible and quite honestly it probably isn't difficult either but it will transform how you think about the grill and the kinds of things that you can put on the grill okay i digressed a little but getting back to the gluten thing less than one percent of the population was is they say has celiac um all the people even that i know that say that they have celiac if they really had celiac they would have a much bigger issue eating most of the stuff that i watch them eat that comes from restaurants and bakeries that are not gluten-free facilities okay celiac is a serious thing do I think that more people have a gluten intolerance than we know about? Certainly, because we're eating it 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, are all glutens created equal? No, it takes different amounts of enzymes and our bodies react differently to different glutens. I don't think that the gluten in barley should be avoided like the plague. Just like I don't think people should stop eating like traditional European dense rye bread. It has gluten in it, but it's made from a completely different flour source than your Fran's Bakery or even your Dave's Killer Bread. So that's my opinion on gluten. I think that in moderation, all foods are serve their purpose, and um, I don't I don't make a habit of buying a lot of bread or bringing a lot of bread home. But I did actually bring some bread home recently from uh, Food Not Bombs but it was a loaf of fresen, like European, like the kind of bread that I grew up on that I have to actually take a knife out and like cut a slice and then I toast it and I put, you know, jalapeno cilantro hummus on it. And anyway, I'm, I'm really happy with that slice of bread, but I don't need to eat a sandwich every day. There's so much other stuff to eat. Yeah. That's boring. It seems like most stuff that is, that's gluten, <laughs> That's not whole food. It's all processed. We probably shouldn't eat it anyway. Yeah, but you know, because it's just over processed. And, right. It's and processed so he, here's so. here's where if you if you can get to a place where you're you're preparing whole foods, and you know, you, I always say I always have a grain and some sort of bean or legume in your fridge combined with whatever you have in your pantry. I mean, this wasn't hard to make. This was really 12 minutes of preparing a grain on the stove. And while it was preparing, I wasn't showering. I was chopping some parsley and snipping up some sun-dried tomatoes. And I took some things out of the cupboard and I put it all together and mixed it up. You know what I mean? It's really easy. I'm gonna give you the recipe, the recipe for a yum bowl in a second. Um, so just to get through this, because we only have a few more minutes left. Um, yeah, don't, don't ignore the seeds too. Sunflower, flax, hemp seed, pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are so good for you. Um, I get pepitas. Uh, Trader Joe's carries them for fairly cheap. You can find them at, um, at, uh, at Grocery Outlet. Also, shiitakes are medicinal. I keep them dried in my cupboard. Um, 
Yeah, there's so many different alternative milks that you can buy. So many different ones. Make sure you rotate. Buy, buy soy and then the next time you see almond on sale, get some almond and the next time you see oat milk on sale, get some oat milk. Um, your body can build up an intolerance to things that we're consuming over and over and over again. So switch it up. Diversity is good nutritionally and it's good so that we stay creative and don't get bored with our food. No reason to be deprived in any sort of dietary shift that you're making, do it slow and gradual, slow and steady wins the race like the tortoise. Um, that's what's gonna be sustainable over a long period of time. And if you do it with intention, um, you know, if you slip up and end up eating something that you don't feel good about physically or mentally or emotionally later, um, you know, don't beat yourself up for it. Just know that every single time you sit down to eat food, you have the ability to make a choice that is probably gonna be better for your, for your health, for the animal's health, for the planet's health. Uh, so just keep practicing, because that's really, it's a practice. Um, spices, I love spices. I buy them in bulk, I take the little jars in there and I'm like, here, can you tear this? You know, if you go to the register first and you set it there and then they can tear it and then you can just put it right into your little jar and you won't buy too much. Um, sometimes that's a big pain for some people and they don't want to do that. I'm actually the person that puts all my jars in my bike and goes down to Sheridan and fills them up, but you can do it any way you want. But I do like having a good spice cabinet. Tahini is a staple because the kale salad is a staple, um, but it's also good for dressings, for salads, and um, uh, I have a friend who likes tahini cookies. I, I'm not a fan of tahini cookies, but she loves tahini cookies. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the difference, the soy sauce is different from the Braggs, is different from the shoyu, is a cultured fermented soy sauce. Um, but pay attention to the sodium levels because the Braggs really has a lot of the enzymes that we need in our food. And by the way, soy sauce you can cook and it, you're not going to lose anything because there's nothing there to lose. Uh, this is something you want to actually add on the end. So steam your vegetables or saute them or... Um, or pan fry, or do whatever you're going to do with your vegetables. Roast them, braise them, flesh, whatever them, and then put the rags on them, and then you won't kill the enzymes that, that your body wants. Any questions about any of this stuff? Um, your maple syrup, do you store your maple syrup in your refrigerator? Mm -hmm. I, 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 didn't, I didn't used to. Um, but then I got mold. I had the same problem, and I didn't realize because yeah. I'd always kept it out because I was yeah. like, it's natural. Yeah. It can be yeah. Catch the tree. Mm. It's not. You yeah. know what I mean? But it, but it has no preservatives in right, it except exactly. for the ones that is tapped from the trees. So, um, yeah, I learned this. I learned yeah, it the same way. Right. I just I keep lost it. A lot of maple syrup. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, somebody gave me a big giant uh, thing of it, and. Um, I didn't, I didn't, at the time it was sort of not new to me because I grew up in Michigan, so maple syrup was sort of like the sweetener of choice, but um, <coughs> I didn't use it fast enough and it went moldy and I was like, what's wrong with my, you know, when, when in doubt, if, if you're concerned about something, um, you know, put it in the fridge just to preserve it. Uh, nuts, if you're not actually going to go through and use your nuts you might want to put your jars in the fridge because that's kind of like why People's Food Co-op and Alberta Food Co-op have their nuts in bins that are refrigerated in a refrigerated area of the cooler. Um, if you just don't go through it, they'll get rancid. I don't think I ever buy so many nuts at one time that, that, that yeah, that I have that problem. But um, I also eat, I eat a fair amount of nuts. So I have one more handout for you, and then we need to end it because it is 9.01. Um, but this is uh, how to make yourself a nutrient-dense, easy-to-prepare, delicious, yum bowl. And step-by-step um, -step ways of putting together produce and grain and toppings and to basically do what I did with this grain salad. And be creative. And oh, and I will tell you one more thing. 
I'll probably tell you several more things before you walk out the door. But there is a book at Powell's and probably other places, but I got my copy at Powell's. It's called The Flavor Bible. And I highly recommend you all own a copy. It's a big hardcover book, The Flavor Bible. It is set up like a dictionary. It is A through Z. Anything you want to, and I, someone told me that there's a vegetarian version, and I'm actually thinking that I will sell back my non-vegetarian version and buy the vegetarian version, because I don't need to know about all of the meats and cheeses that are in there. But you can look up rhubarb, and it will tell you what season, what its flavor profile is, all the ways that you can prepare it, braise, saute, roast, da 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 da. And then it gives you a list of all the other flavors that it pairs with. Mm -hmm. And then it has these little boxes that are like the top chefs of the country got together and they were like, strawberry and rhubarb pie and rhubarb and prunes or like whatever flavor combinations that they personally have discovered, developed, or in some fashion um, present to their customers in the restaurant. Um, it's super handy. If you, it's called the Flavor Bible. They have it at the library. They have it at the library, but I can't imagine. I can't. I can't imagine getting it at the library because I, when you're in the kitchen, would you say? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I took one look at it and was like, this is an indispensable tool in my kitchen. And actually, it should really be um on the basic tool list because. You know, how many times when, you know, you open up the fridge and you're like, okay, I have bok choy and I have da 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 and I have blah, blah, blah. And a lot of times um, I'll look something up and it'll be like, lemon goes with this, but, you know, lime isn't on the list. And, uh, you know, it's pretty spot on. It's a great way to put together flavor combinations that you wouldn't have thought. And then suddenly you're like, oh, I have those things in my cupboard. Great. So... Um, so that concludes the class portion. Do you have a question? Any comments about prop class? Oh! make a space for me. Thanks. Um, I didn't have water all day today, and so I was late getting the stuff in the crock pot, and I was late, da 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 Anyway, the day always has some challenges in it. This is still bubbling, but it's probably done. I'm starving, so I'm gonna actually have some um, while I'm cleaning up. It's really hot. Um, but these are flaglio lay beans and carrots and garlic with five cups of water on top of them simmered for a really long time and then I added thyme and rosemary and parsley to it. So if you feel like sampling, it is super hot. Um, the other thing is, is that before you leave, if you could do me the, the favor of um, any, any feedback or things that you wish that I had covered or um, anything, and there's a little, there's a little envelope here, there's pens up here in each of these pens that come with the other pens. Um, and you can just, you know, take one and write whatever and uh, tuck it in there. Um, yeah. And the Unitarian Universalist uh, Animal Ministry from the First Unitarian Church of Portland is um, the organization that sponsored this free class. And uh, originally it was a auction item at the annual fundraising auction at First Unitarian Church. So if you feel called or moved to donate to 
any of the ingredients or the space, um, feel free to. But uh, I would, yes, I would love to get your opinions. And if you think that this class should be available to other people, uh, I'm also curious how much you would have paid for this class had you not been able to come for free. Mm. So feel free to write any and all of that stuff down. There's still more popcorn. There's um, coconut bacon. There's whatever. Help yourself to any food that is left. So you are a professional cook. Um, I do a lot of things, but I, you know, I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm not a professional cook because I live cooking for myself. Uh huh. Well, and you do uh, a great job. Well, you thank you. Your knowledge is amazing. <laughs> thank you. I definitely like to eat good food, and I'm a I'm a fan of figuring out like if if I can figure out how to make. Yeah, it's really interesting. The way she puts things together. That's I have so a good. question and a comment. Sure. Okay. Well, the question is: I started working at. Um, okay. Back up real quick. So my s body was feeling weird like a year ago. I started cutting out like gluten things, but started feeling better a lot of it because I was also not really eating dairy, not really eating as much processed food. Like the exact examples that you gave, when you stop eating gluten, you stop eating a lot of other things. It's hard to figure it out. Oh, um, yeah. And so feeling better, started working at this school. Mm -hmm. And um, we have lunch every day there, and it's like known to be like really tasty and really healthy and really local and all that stuff. But something that's in that's used across the board has been like disagreeing with me, and I don't know what it is. And I I'm are you eating like, like an oil or like are you eating organic? It's not all organic. Okay, so that might be somewhere to start, and I don't know how much organic you eat the rest of the time. Mm -hmm. um, they're cross 